Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad you're with us. Thank you for all those tuning in on our Facebook live stream page. We're glad that you've tuned in to us this morning. Alana and I are happy to be back. It's fun to visit and to enjoy time with family away, but it, there's nothing like coming back home. And so it's good to see all your smiling faces looking back at me this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, There Were Three Crosses. Taking our text from Luke 23, verse 33. And just in case we have some country music fans and you got all excited, we're not talking about three wooden crosses by Randy Travis' song. That's not what we're... Even though I know how it starts out, that's not what we're talking about this morning. However, we will be talking about three wooden crosses on Calvary. So I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 23. We're going to be looking in a couple different passages throughout the Gospels that mention these three crosses and talk about what they are. But in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus says that we must take up our cross daily and follow after him. He says you must deny yourself. You must pick up your cross and follow him daily. Now, in that time period, when Jesus would say this, <clears throat> the cross was a symbol of execution. This was a symbol of death. And Jesus says, be willing to take up that cross daily and follow after him. And his, his followers might have wondered, why is he talking about something so gruesome, something so ugly at that time period? You know, today we see crosses on jewelry and on the backs of cars and and I'm not knocking any of that. But think about in this time period, that, that was not the case. This was an instrument of death and execution. Jesus is saying you need to be willing to pick that up. What he's saying is in denying yourself, whatever your cross is that you are called to bear, you need to be willing to pick it up and follow him. Let nothing stop you from following him. This morning, we're going to talk about these three crosses because I believe there's lessons we can learn from each one. And each one could represent a cross that we might be carrying today. But I said three crosses appeared on Calvary. Calvary is from the Latin Calvaria. And it means the skull. The same as the Hebrew word Golgotha that we're going to read in the, the Gospels. Golgotha means a skull. It is the Greek word Cranion, which also means the skull. So whether we're reading it in the Greek, cranion, whether we're reading it in the Hebrew, which they translate for us, Golgotha, or we're reading from the Latin, Calvaria, it all means the skull. So let's read from Matthew chapter 27 and verse 33, Mark 15, 22, and John 19, verse 17. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 33. It says, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. So here in Matthew, he's speaking in Greek, but he gives us the Hebrew word Golgotha and then translates it because he's talking to Greek speaking Jews. So he says they came to the place called Golgotha, a place of the skull. Mark 15, 22. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Again, giving us the translation of Golgotha. The word Calvary is found only in the King James and New King James. So I'm going to be reading from Luke 23, 33. The text I said was our text this morning from the New King James. And that reads, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So Calvary only appears in the King James and New King James. But this comes from how popular the Latin Vulgate was. A historian and, and a scribe named Jerome translated both the Hebrew, which was already in Greek from the Septuagint, but he took the New Testament, which was also in Greek, and he said he took the Hebrew or the Old Testament and the New Testament, which were both in Greek, and he translated it into Latin. And this was the text for over a thousand years until the Bible began being translated into English. But for over a thousand years, Latin was the language. And so a lot of people, think of all the people that grew up hearing it in Latin. So even when they translated it from the King James in 1611, translating it into English, they just called it Calvary. 
That's what they would have been used to because of Jerome's translation that became so popular. So whether we're reading of Calvary, Golgotha, or Cranian, they all mention this is the place of crucifixion. John 19, 17 says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So John just spells it out for us. It's called the place of the skull. And then he tells us the Hebrew word for it is Golgotha. So over and over, we can read through the Gospels that they record this word. Three of them, Matthew, Mark, and John, record the Hebrew word Golgotha. But all four of them tell us it was the place of a skull, and they crucified Jesus there at that place. Apparently, Golgotha doesn't have the poetic ring to it as Calvary does, because how many hymns can you name that sing of the hill of Golgotha or the cross of Golgotha? It just doesn't have the same poetic ring. So we today still sing it in the Latin term, Calvary. But lest we ever forget what that means, Calvary means the skull. It's from Calvaria. That would be the Latin translation. There were three crosses at Calvary or Golgotha. Matthew 27, 38, Mark 15, 27, Luke 23, 33, In John 19, 18, all four Gospels record there were three crosses there at Golgotha. Matthew 27, 38 says, At that time two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Mark 15, 27, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Luke 23, 33, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. We read the same passage just a minute ago from the New King James where it says Calvary. Here in the New American Standard, the translators got rid of the Latin since they're translating directly from the Greek, and they just tell us what it means. They came to the place called the skull. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. So Luke calls them criminals. Matthew and Mark tell us that they were robbers. John chapter 19, 18 says, There they crucified him, and with him two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. So all three, all four Gospels, two of them mention they were robbers. One calls them criminals, and one says two other men. But they all paint the picture of three crosses on Calvary, this place called the Skull. And Jesus is in the middle. Jesus is the center cross. A lot of people like to try to figure out whether these two men belong with Barabbas or not. You might remember the account of Barabbas. He is called an insurrectionist. That would mean he's a rebel or a traitor. He was a murderer and he was a robber or a thief. And so some people try to decide since Barabbas was set free and he was scheduled to die, maybe these were some of his men that were there with the insurrection. We don't know. They're not called insurrectionists. They are called thieves or robbers. All that really matters is that fulfillment of prophecy was taking place. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus was going to be killed with criminals, lawbreakers. And here he is directly in the middle of two men that were deserving of their sentence. There were three crosses at Calvary. All four Gospels record that. And the crosses of Calvary represent three very different death scenes, with each with its own lesson. And that's what we're going to talk about. But I want you to think about, as we go through each one of these crosses and what it might represent, I want you to be thinking about the personal application to Luke 9 and verse 23 when it says, we are to take up our cross and follow him. What cross would that be? What cross is it talking about for you and for me? The first that I want us to look at, and I don't know whether this cross was to the left or the right hand of Jesus, that is not specified in the Gospels, but one of those crosses to either side of Jesus was the cross of impenitence. This is the picture of one dying in sin, and over this cross might be written three words. The first is lawlessness. We can read, and as we have already read in Matthew 27, 38, Mark 15, 27, and Luke 23, 33, he was a robber. He was a criminal. He was a lawbreaker. So one of the words we could read there is lawlessness. He lived outside of God's laws as well as man's. And now he was sentenced to die 
as a thief. He showed no remorse for his actions, and he remained impenitent to the end. The second word that might be written over his cross is the word hardness. In Matthew 27 and verse 44, we're going to do some reading here of these three crosses. So turn over with me to Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 44. I want you to think about this scene. Here are three men lifted up, made a public, public spectacle, Jesus in the center. The Jews come by, and it says, we can read several times where they come by, and they're wagging their heads in disgust and shame at Jesus. But these two men on either side of him are there, and they're witnesses to this. They hear the Jews' mocking words. They hear their blasphemous words to Jesus. They hear their tone of derision. They can hear the absolute ridicule, perhaps even the absolute joy at seeing Jesus on that cross. And we read in Matthew 27 and verse 44. And before we read that, we see in verse 39. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. In verse 43, they're quoting from Psalm 22 in verse 8. They're quoting Scripture. And just as the devil can twist Scripture, so these men twist Scripture in order to hurl abuse and mockery at our Lord. And they say, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. They were insulting him with the same words. So we read of the passers-by, we read of the religious leaders of the day, there in verse 41, the chief priests with the scribes and elders, mocking him, saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. So we read of one of these men hurling the same abuse, or actually, actually at this point in time, it mentions both robbers are saying the exact same things as the Jewish leaders were. He hardened his heart against the Savior of the world who was dying unjustly. And despite the closeness to God's love, pain racking his own body, and eternity staring him in his face, his only appeal was one of contempt for Jesus. I want you to turn back to Luke 23 as we still read of this man and look at what he says in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there. So in Matthew, it mentions there at one point, both robbers are hurling abuse, but something changes shortly before Jesus' death. And now we read that one of them, in verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Remember what Christ means. It means the anointed one of God. That's what Messiah means. That's the Hebrew word for Christ. Messiah, Christos. It means the anointed one of God. Are you not the anointed one of God? Save yourself and us. You know Flying on planes as recently as Alana and I did, I'm reminded of their safety video that plays at the beginning where it says that in the case of an emergency, oxygen masks are going to come down. Put one on yourself first, put your own mask on, and then help others. That way you're not going to fall prey to the lack of oxygen as you're trying to help others. You're not going to do anyone any good if you are not saved. So he says put the oxygen mask on first and then save. That's what this guy's saying. He says get down off the cross yourself and then save us. Save yourself and then us. He's hurling the same abuse at Jesus as the religious leaders were. And in this case, he's saying, save yourself and us. Do you realize his last recorded words on earth were abuse against the Son of God? This is a man dying in sin who is impenitent. The third word that we might write over the cross is temporal. There in Luke 23, verse 39, he wasn't thinking of his soul in eternity. 
He was thinking of the saving of his body. He was carnally minded. Save me, I'm in pain. Being nailed to a cross was a horrific, torturous death. Do you know what you died from, hanging from the cross? It was, you died of asphyxiation. You couldn't breathe. The muscles in your arms would give out. You would have to use your feet, which were normally placed on a block and nailed into that block. So you have pain in your feet, and you'd have to use your feet and your knees to lift yourself up so you can breathe. So the seven times we read of Jesus speaking, he had to lift himself up to take that breath and to speak. It was exhausting and taxing on the body, and usually the heart would either give out or you would die because you couldn't breathe. And the last words recorded of this man was hurling abuse at Jesus. He remained impenitent. There's a lesson here on this cross. Jesus never promised to save us from the cross. Jesus never promised to save us from our cross, whatever that is. What he did, though, is promise to save us through his cross. He had eternity on his mind. In Ephesians 2.16, we're told that because of the blood shed on, his, on that cross, he reconciled man to man and man to God. It was through his blood that he drew us near to God. We cannot be saved on our own terms, but we must submit to God. Hebrews 5.9 says he's the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. The impenitent heart, that is the lawless heart, will die in its sins. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Luke 13, 3, Mark 16, 16, John 8, 24, a whole host of other passages. That the impenitent heart will meet a grisly end. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. That road, that broad road that leads to destruction is also described as a second death. A death where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. From Mark chapter 9, 43 through 44. Saints should suffer for being Christ-like. That is to be Christians, not as a lawbreaker. 1 Peter 4, 4, 14 through 16 tells us that if we're going to suffer in this life, it better be as a Christian. And if we suffer as a Christian, then we're to glorify God in that name. But he says, don't suffer as a lawbreaker. Don't suffer justly for something that you've done and you deserve the punishment that is due. He says, if you suffer as a Christian, then you're to glorify God in that name. The death of the impenitent heart is a picture of judgment and eternal punishment. And we certainly see a cross of impenitence on Calvary. But just as we have a cross of impenitence on Calvary, we have a cross of repentance Again, we don't know if this man is to the right or the left of Jesus. What we do know is he's on one of the sides of Jesus. And and this is the cross of one dying to sin. This is a picture of one that is dying to sin. We read that he was also a robber and a criminal. But we read that over this cross could be written three words. Belief. We read that he was a robber, he was a criminal. We see that in three of the Gospels, as we've already read. Matthew 27, 38, Mark 15, 27, Luke 23, 33. In the beginning, he also insulted Christ. Matthew 27, verses 43 and 44. That the robbers were also saying these things. But somewhere, he had a repentant heart. And over his cross could be written these three words. The first is belief. In Luke 23, 40 through 41... Turn over to Luke 23 and look at his story, starting in verse 40. In verse 39, we read that one of the criminals was hurling abuse. In verse 40, it says, But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. He rebuked the impenitent thief out of righteous indignation. He says, do you not even fear God? This man recognizes we're here because we belong here. (laughs) Our choices in life led us to this moment. What we have done, we have done and deserve this punishment. But do you realize 
that his voice is the first voice recorded to vindicate Jesus as innocent? Oh, Pilate declared him innocent on a number of occasions. Just in Luke 23 alone, Pilate declares Jesus innocent four times. But Pilate didn't really believe that. Oh, I believe he believed he was innocent. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying Pilate had the absolute authority as the governor to, if he saw Jesus was innocent, to release him regardless of what the crowd said or wanted. His job was that as a governor and a magistrate, his job was to see justice done. Not the popular will of the people. And he tried to placate them by releasing to them any prisoner of their choice, and they chose Barabbas, who incidentally was an insurrectionist, the very charge they accused Jesus with. That's kind of ironic and funny. And I'm sure it wasn't lost on Pilate. We read in Mark 15 that Pilate knew why they delivered him up. It was out of envy or jealousy. But Pilate had it within him. He had the power and the full might of the Roman government backing that power to release Jesus. And yet... He did not. He declared him innocent, but he did not defend him. He had him scourged, bloodied, beaten within an inch of his life, and then had him carry his own cross and sentenced him to death, knowing that he was innocent. That's what Pilate did. No, this thief, on the other side of that sentencing, is the first voice to vindicate and defend Jesus' innocence. He says, we deserve this. This man has done nothing wrong. He rebuked the other robber. He showed he believed in and feared God. He says, do you not even fear God? So we would also write over his cross the word remorse. In Luke 23, 40 through 41, he admitted guilt and punishment as just. He says, do you not even fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. One man saw Jesus as one of them. Save yourself and then save us. You're one of us. You're you're dying with us. This man saw Jesus as something completely different. He saw Jesus as that innocent, spotless Lamb of God. He says, we're here under the same condemnation, the same sentence. We're all dying together is what he's saying. But the difference is you and I deserve it. He says, our punishment is just. And if he could have pointed, he probably would have pointed at Jesus. And in one way he was, since he's on one side of him, one's arm is already out. He says, this man has done nothing wrong. He was not thinking carnally like the other man was, but he was thinking eternal. Notice now, after rebuking the other man, whatever side he's on, he's talking past Jesus to that man. And now he speaks to the man and the sinner. And now in verse 42, he turns his attention directly to Jesus. Read with me in verse 42. And he was saying, Jesus, he knew his name. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. This man looked to Jesus for eternal salvation. Unlike the other thief who only thought of temporal relief from his suffering and pain and being released from this death, this man looked to Jesus for eternal salvation. His words expressed a belief not only in God, but also in his son. He makes no demands, but he calls out to the Lord for mercy. And he knows who the Lord is. He recognized that Jesus had the power and the authority to forgive sins. And he says in verse 42, Remember me when you come in your kingdom. This man defending him, recognizing his own just suffering and sentence of death, did not go unnoticed by Jesus. We read in verse 43, And he said to him, Truly I say to you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. This man said, don't forget me. Jesus said, done. You'll be with me. Not only will I not forget you, but you'll be with me. 
As they die together, this man will be with Jesus in the resurrection afterwards. It's an amazing scene there on Calvary where one man dies in his sins while another man previously to dying is released from his sins and told that he'll be received with Jesus in paradise. He lived and died under the old law. He lived and died before Jesus rose again to issue the command to be baptized in order to be saved. Jesus rose from the dead and then gave the command for baptism of all the nations in Mark 16, 15 to 16. Jesus had to die first to nail the old, old law to the cross, Colossians 2, 13 to 14. So this scene cannot be used as it is today to prove salvation without baptism. But we need to recognize it for what it is. It is a beautiful statement of a man who defends Jesus' innocence, who knows that he is God because he turns to him and says in verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He knew who Jesus was. And he says, remember me. We need to take it for what it is. Jesus offered that mercy and pardon this man so desperately needed, not for physical release from the cross, but his soul's eternity. There's a lesson here for us too. We must believe in Jesus and fear God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14 says that it, the duty of man, man's all, I love is the way it says in the New King James, is to fear God and keep his commandments. It says this is man's all because one day there is a day fixed of judgment where the secrets of man, both good and bad, will be judged. We must believe in Christ and fear him. We, may, we must make no demands or try to be saved in our way, but simply submit to Christ's authority. Today, his authority says to all the nations, you must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. That's what Jesus sent his disciples to say in Mark 16, 16. Accept responsibility for our actions and sins and turn to Christ. The other man didn't offer any repentance. The other man acted as if he was there because nothing that he had done. We don't see him showing remorse. We don't see him taking responsibility. We see him hurling abuse at Jesus and mocking him as well as others and saying, save yourself and then save us. With this man, this cross that represents the cross of repentance... We see this man owning his sin, owning the sentence he was under, and simply asking Jesus to be remembered. We must come to him making no demands, not to be saved in our way. Submit to his authority. Accept responsibility for our own actions and sins. And we see that in Acts 2, verse 37. After Peter tells the Jews on the day of Pentecost they were responsible for putting Jesus to death by the hands of godless men, they said, brothers, what do we do? They were guilty. And they weren't arguing that point. They were pricked in their hearts and they said, what do we do? And Peter told them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of those sins. The death of a repentant heart is the picture of pardon and eternal reward. But then we turn our minds not to the, side, the cro two crosses on either side of the sinner, but we turn our minds to that sinner cross. And this simply represents the cross of sacrifice. This is the picture of dying, of one dying for sin. We saw the picture of one dying in sin, the picture of dying to sin. This is the one dying for sin. In addition to the words that Pilate added, Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, or Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in addition to those words that Pilate written, we could write three words over this cross. The first would be sinless. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that he knew no sin. That statement alone is enough to make us feel ashamed of our former lives of sin. Because for us, he endured mockery. For us, he endured the scourging. For us, he endured the crown of thorns. For us, he endured the humiliation for us, he endured the cross of a criminal. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us he was the just for the unjust. He died in our stead. And as I've pointed out in other lessons, we are so thankful that Barabbas was released. Because we are Barabbas. We are the ones that deserved that death. Barabbas being set free and Jesus literally taking his place 
Jesus took our place. Jesus died for us, but he was sinless. The word forgiveness, Luke 23, 34, with all the abuse being hurled at him, we read this, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And as he says that, they're casting lots for his garments. Jesus had a forgiving heart even there on the cross. He did not hurl abuse back. He did not try to correct their false assumptions and their false statements. He simply prayed for forgiveness for his accusers and abusers. Ephesians chapter 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And over that cross, we would read the next word, love. John 3, 16, the motivation for all that he did was love. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that those that believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The motivating factor for Jesus to make such a sacrifice, to endure the hostility of sinners against himself, was love. Romans 5, 8 says that Christ demonstrated the love of God on that day. Love is sacrificial. And on that day on Calvary, God demonstrated it. Jesus with his arms stretched out as if telling the world, I love you this much. He was willing to do and to pay whatever price was necessary. Not my will, but your will be done, he prayed. The lesson for us is simply this. In Jesus, in Christ, the anointed one of God is forgiveness there is love, and there is hope. In Acts 4 and verse 12, we read there's no other name. The death of Christ is a picture of love of God and the eternal hope of man. There's no other name by which we can be saved but Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That thief, as he was dying, recognized that in Jesus was his only hope for eternal salvation. And he turned to him in his last moments. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. The death of Christ is that picture of the love of God and that eternal hope that we have. The crosses of the thieves demonstrate two attitudes. The impenitent person who hardens his heart in the presence of Christ. Here he was right next to him. He doesn't cry out for mercy. What he cries out for is abuse and mockery. Save yourself and then save us. But we also see the penitent person who breaks down and submits in the presence of Christ. He accepted his sin. He accepted his fate. And yet could only cry out to Jesus for mercy. When we look at the sinner cross, John 19, 18, we see in Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. There's important lessons to either side, but our eyes focus on that sinner cross because that is the man that died that grants hope of eternity. We see an example of humility and obedience that we're told to have in our own minds. Philippians 2, 5 and verse 8. And Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 says to pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus. <clears throat> what cross do we carry? Are we bearing that, are we bearing that impenitent cross? That hardness of heart that even in the presence of Christ today that we will not obey, we will not submit. Are we carrying the penitent cross? The cross that says when I mess up, when I sin, I will ask for forgiveness. I will own my sins. I will own the responsibility. But the cross that Jesus is calling us to bear is that one of sacrifice. To deny self. To deny the pleasures of this world. Anything that takes us between, anything that comes between us and God. He says, that's the cross you're to bear. That's the cross Jesus bore, the cross of sacrifice. What cross are you carrying this morning? Jesus died for us and offers mercy and pardon and an eternal reward. Revelation twenty two twelve 12 says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. We must believe and confess our sins, repent and obey the Lord. That's what Hebrews 5, 9 says. From Christ's side, one person may go to heaven and another to hell. 
In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, we can read there, there were three crosses. They were each on either side of Jesus. From his side, one may go to heaven, one may go to hell. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jesus describes that, that day of judgment. Well, he will judge all the nations, small and great. He'll separate them to his right and to his left. From one side goes to heaven, from the other side to eternal punishment, to hell. Question for us this morning, what side of the cross are you on? Is your heart impenitent this morning? Or do you have the penitent heart, ready and willing to accept responsibility for what you have done and to simply come to God for mercy and pardon and grace, seeking forgiveness? What side of the cross are you on? And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. To repent and be baptized into his name that you might have that forgiveness of sins. That your sins might be washed away and you can be turned from the sin and and the color of scarlet made white as wool. In Jesus, that is possible. This morning, if you're a Christian in error, don't wait till it's eternally too late. Don't bear that impenitent cross. Repent and be renewed. Remove whatever barrier it is that stands between you and your God. And we can assist you in any manner this morning, whether the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf. Come forward and let it be known now while together we stand and sing.